Okay, so just bear with us for a few a few minutes. I'll confirm as soon as we're live. Okay. Okay, confirming our live and the meeting can commence. Uh, right, thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start off um, this meeting and thank you for everybody joining us. And if there's any members of the public, you're all very welcome. Um, it's very important that we maintain um, systems of democracy, oversight and our responsibility as elected members. But before we commence with the meeting, Will colleagues join with me in spending a few moments in reflection for those who have tragically lost their lives in this pandemic and for those in the NHS, fire, police and other essential public services that have put the safety of the public first, they take on daily risks and continue to support our community. Thank you. In addition, I'm sure all members will join with me in thanking all the staff of the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority who have worked through this crisis at the centre of the national effort and in so many ways continue to make us proud and to keep us safe. The danger of fire is ever present as we saw yesterday in St Helens and is no respecter of the other pressures upon us. A great and sincere thanks to all our staff, all of whom are heroes. Thank you. So this is the um, Merseyside Fire Authority meeting. Um, I'll now move on to explain how the meeting will work. During the meeting, all microphones, except mine and the chiefs, I think, um, will be switched off. Uh, and uh, Kelly, should anyone leave the meeting for any reason, the meeting will continue uh, unless it falls out of the normal rules of being quarrelled. Privacy and confidentiality. Please ensure that any items relating to per or exempt on the agenda today uh, are kept uh, confidential and away from the cameras. Um, please be advised that all proceedings of this meeting will be recorded and broadcast on YouTube, live for members and the public to see. Etiquette, please ensure that when you are not speaking, your microphone remains on mute and your camera switched off. We will turn these back on. Comments and questions. If you wish to speak at any point, please turn on your camera and raise your hand. This is a, a very rudimentary indication. The meeting facilitator will then unmute your microphone and invite you to speak at the appropriate time and in the order um, that anybody has indicated. You should then click to confirm that you wish to unmute your microphone, a box will come up on your screen, and then state your questions and comments. Um, muting, please don't try to unmute yourself. The meeting facilitator will do this for you. There will be a slight delay, uh, milliseconds, and then you will be prompted to allow yourself to be unmuted. And uh, please click the blue button to say unmute now to do so. Approving items. This may be a little bit more complicated. When I request you all to approve or note an item, I will ask you to turn your on your camera and the meeting facilitator will then unmute everybody. If you have any issues, this will be your opportunity to raise them. And I think all of us are struggling with this in our own authorities. But broadly speaking, at the end of an item, if I say the recommendation is that be noted and agreed, if there are any who don't accept the agreement, please indicate. We could have a recorded vote. You know, if we got to the stage of, no, this is not agreed, there's a, it's controversial. We, but I don't think today, I'm, I'm guessing, that we'll actually have that. Um, we will see how the vote goes, but I, I think that in most cases today, it will be the recommendation is to approve that. All those uh, silent and agreed, anyone who doesn't agree, please indicate. So what we're going to now do is we're going to move on to a rolled call 
because we need to record for the minutes all of those that are in attendance. So Kelly, uh, could you now take the roll call? Yes, of course. Um, so when I say your name, can you please confirm your name and confirm that you can hear and I will confirm that you can be heard. Um, once you've um, been confirmed, um, I will mute you again and if you could please turn off your camera at that point, that would be great. Okay, so Councillor Del Arno. We can't can't hear you, Councillor Arnold, sorry. You're still muted, Cal. Yeah. I can confirm that I can hear everything. And I'm Councillor Del Arno from Nose Borough Council. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. We can hear you. Councillor Dan Barrington. Councillor Daniel Barrington from Liverpool. I can hear everything. That's great. Thank you very much. We can hear you. Councillor Angela Coleman. Hi, Angela, Angela Coleman from Liverpool City Council. And yeah, I can confirm I can hear everyone. And we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just looking for Councillor Grace. You missed Bruce Berry. I'm here. Oh. Councillor Berry. Yes, uh, Councillor Bruce Berry, Mott West and Solar Massey. I'm here, present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brian Kenny. Thank you. I am. Sorry. Hello, yes, Councillor Brian Kenny from Whittle Council. I am present and can confirm I can hear everything fine. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Kenny. Councillor Dory Knight. Councillor Dory Knight. Councillor Dory Knight from Liverpool. I can hear everybody. Great, we can hear you, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Andrew Makinson. Councillor Andrew Makinson from Liverpool City Council. I can hear everybody. Great, thank you very much. We can hear you. Councillor Linda Maloney. Hi, Linda Maloney from St Helens, and I can hear everybody. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Steph O'Keefe. Steph O'Keefe, Nosey Borough Council, and I can hear you, Kelly. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Lisa Preston. Hi everybody, it's Councillor Lisa Preston and I can hear everybody. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Leslie Rennie. Yes, Councillor Leslie Rennie from Wirraborough Council and present and can hear everybody. That's great, we can hear you. Councillor James Roberts. Uh, Councillor James Roberts from Liverpool City Council, I can hear you just fine. Great, we can hear you, thanks. Councillor Emily Spurrell. Hi, Councillor Emily Spurrell from Liverpool. That's great, we can hear you, thanks. Councillor Jean Stapleton. Oh. Councillor Jean Stapleton. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm here. Wirral Council, Jean Stapleton, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you, we can hear you. Councillor Lynn Thompson. Uh, Councillor Lynn Thompson, Sefton Council, and I can hear everybody. Thank you. 
That's great, thank you. And Councillor Paul Tweed. Councillor Paul Tweed. Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. But, I, I, but I'm not on the scope. <laughs> Am I, supposed, am, am I supposed to be able to see myself now on the screen or not? No. Uh, can you, can we you can hear us? You. We can okay. see you. Can you hear I, us? I can hear everybody. Good afternoon. Great. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we missed off Jan Grace. You mentioned her, but she didn't come back on. Sorry. Um, struggling to... I'm struggling to find Councillor Grace. I'm not sure if she's uh, if she's Still dropped off. Yes, I think she may have uh, we may have had some fallen, connection issues. Fallen into a black hole. Yes. <laughs> and there's myself. I can hear everybody. Um, if you try to make make contact with Councillor Grace, uh, uh, fine. Otherwise, we'll note that and we'll move on. Um, so, um, so, we've also got uh, Anthony Boyle and uh, the independent member, Cal. Sorry. Yeah, I can hear everybody clearly. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, at that point, um, you know, we probably will have to smarten that up because it's, you know, it can be a bit boring, can't it? But it's one of the things. Um, so, we move on to preliminary matters. Uh, apologies for absence. We have no apologies for absence recorded. Uh, people may drop in and out as the technology allows. Declarations of interest. This is an opportunity here for anybody who has a declaration of interest on any of the items on the agenda to turn the camera and the uh, microphone back on and indicate that they have a declaration of interest or type something in the chat uh, I'll leave a pause there for anybody to declare uh, a declaration of interest. Okay, so then we move on to matters of urgency. There are no matters of urgency that would change the running order of the agenda. Uh, I, and there are no exempt items, nothing on uh, you know, special pages uh, in this meeting. So uh, we now move on to the Chair, just before you move on, uh, Councillor Janet Grace has just joined the meeting. Okay. Cal, do you want to just confirm that Councillor Grace can hear you? Yes, Councillor Grace, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Um, I could hear you before. I did send a couple of chats saying I thought I'd disappeared, but um, I've just came, uh, went out and come back in. Great, thank you. We can hear you. Cheers. Sorry, Chair. No problems. Um, okay, this is this is part of the technology, you know. Um, so minutes. Now the minutes have been circulated with the pack of papers. I'd also normally say, has everybody got to the satisfaction all the papers that they think that they should have? Again, if there's anybody who feels that they haven't had the papers, could you send a, a chat message through? And we'll deal with that. But I'm making a, a, a working assumption that everyone's got the papers. Uh, so the minutes, I'm going to recommend that the minutes be agreed. Uh, would anybody who has a contrary view please indicate by chat or, or camera and uh, video or microphone? Okay, so Councillor Thompson. I'm going to make a presumption that the minutes are agreed. If anyone is to the contrary, let me know. So uh, next is uh, the running order of the agenda. It's um, item three, uh, pages 25 to 32, and that would be the amendments to standing orders for the ability to operate remotely. And I assume that Ria is going to lead on this item. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. So on the 4th of April 2020, the local authorities 
and police and crime panels, coronavirus, flexibility of local authorities, police and crime panel meetings, regulations 2020 were enacted, which enabled local authorities to hold committee meetings remotely. These will apply to any meetings held before the 7th of May 2021, and they are applicable to Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority. This means that members are not required to attend meetings at the same physical location and members will still be determined as in attendance at a meeting that is held remotely, which can be a virtual location as we are today, as long as a, a minimum criteria is met within the regulations, which is to be able to hear and be heard, which we've just demonstrated. The regulations provide flexibility for the authority in respect of altering the frequency of meetings, moving or cancelling meetings without the requirement of further notice, which also has an impact to the AGM, which may be held at a later date or rolled over till next year. At paragraph 10 of the agenda, it's clear that the regulations automatically override any existing procedures that are in place or stand in orders within the relevant constitution. However, it's felt that for good practice that uh, stand in orders will be amended to reflect the impact of the regulations and that can be found at Appendix A of the report. That's at page 29. So within that, it references where the meetings of the authority may be held, which will be possibly a virtual location as we are today how meetings remain quiet, as well as how voting will be conducted at this present time, as well as declaration of interest and how the public can participate and attend. Again, provisions to be attending remotely, which are in place today as it's being streamed. I'm happy to take any questions on that. The recommendation is for members to approve the Appendix A, which is the detail of the remote meeting standing order. Thank you, Ria. Um, just as a comment, we're holding the date, 11th of June, is it? Just from memory, yeah. of the, um, the AGM as a placeholder. All being well, uh, we'll have a meeting then virtually. Um, it may well be subject to consultation with the groups that we uh, just operate on a status quo basis. Um, we roll forward all the appointments, uh, but it, if it's v v fairly non-controversial, we can have a, a meeting um, of the authority virtually, record the uh, any amendments or changes that districts have to the membership of the authority and any other housekeeping bits and bobs that there may be. So the agenda uh, item with the uh, which is capturing the legislative changes proposed to the constitution is there for members to consider. Uh, are there any questions? If you have a question, either send a chat or turn your uh, camera and microphone back on and um, we can have questions. So I'm taking it uh, from that point that there's nobody indicated they want questions. So the next thing is to say, I'm making uh, a recommendation this item is agreed. And if uh, I'm assuming that members will agree with that, if every, everybody is in agreement, fine. If anybody has any contrary uh, or would like to vote against, could you again either send a chat message, turn your camera on, on and, um, uh, and indicate that you would like to vote against? So I think we've got agreement to that. I'm going to take it for the purpose of the minute uh, item three, amendments to the standing orders has been agreed by the authority. We move on to item four, Local Government Association subscription 2021. Uh, this was a, a decision that uh, officers circulated a paper on. Uh, we had a virtual vote, if you like, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the decision needs to be captured at this stage. I, I, I do think that as it's only a relatively small amount, £11,000. And it's one of those, everyone's a member sort of thing. All fire authorities are in membership. It could well be a, a rolling on decision from year to year, but we've 
we've identified it this year for specific consideration. So, uh, will uh, Chief, will you speak to this, or Ria, are you going to speak to this item? About the I, I will. I will speak to it, Chair. Thank you. Um, so the paper is for, as you have mentioned, the members to note the continued membership to the LGA for 20 to 2021. 20, 20, 20, uh, members have been the, a long-standing member of the LGA for some time now, and correspondence was received in regards to continuing that membership with an offer of a 2.5% loyalty discount, as well as a, a further 2.5% discount for continuing with the subscription via direct debit with a deadline of the Friday, the 24th of April 2020. This is why um, the decision was made to continue subscription with the agreement of the chair under the provisions of the standing order in the constitution. Members were made aware of the proposal with a deadline to provide any objections of which there were none. There is a detail in Appendix A, which is a letter from the Chief Executive of the LGA to the Chief Fire Officer, which has detailed some of the substantial work that's already taken place and assisted all fire and rescue services as part of their subscription to the service. If there's any more questions, I'm happy to take them. Chair, I think Councillor so Kenny wishes to raise, make, raise a question. Please, Councillor Kenny. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Just to confirm, I've got no problem at all with the recommendation, but it's just a question under um, 2B of the recommendation. What exactly is meant by the term not on notice? What, what does that mean exactly, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ria? Yeah, um, so that was in respect of the um, continued subscription that um, we, we, it just rolls over effectively that we haven't had any new notification for a fall within the subscription. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think Councillor Grace would like to make a comment. Yes, Councillor Grace. It's Councillor Arnold. I'm sorry. Just no, to... I'm sorry. I, sorry, I, I did want to make a comment, if that's possible. Of course. Um, I can't get the camera to roll. So um, okay, we can hear you. It, it was apart from the excellent training events I've been on with um, LGA, uh, I'm also involved with the Equality and Diversity uh, National Group for them. So I'm very keen that... that um, we keep in touch with them because I, I believe they're doing a lot of really good work that we will benefit from. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, our subscription to the LGA used to be exactly the same because we were a metropolitan authority as every single council, big council. So in years gone by, I'm talking about a decade ago, our subscription was over £60,000 and every single Metropolitan Fire Authority chipped up and said, come on, this is ridiculous. So our subscription was reduced substantially, but there is still the Fire Services Management Committee, the Fire Commission, all the work, to be frank, a lot of work that they've been doing in terms of the um, high-rise flats, the Grenfell Tower, and an awful lot of support work to officers, the work they do... Um, is all funded, the, the NJC, that's the National Joint Council, so that terms and conditions of engagement, pay rise and so forth, is all funded by that a subscription as well. I think if, as we've said that we will do, we'll take this to scrutiny committee. Scrutiny committee can look at the issues in the LGA, um, but uh, for this point in time, what we're doing is we're capturing a decision that's already been made under the delegated powers of the chief officer in consultation with the chair. Uh, and so what I'm going to do again is make a, uh, a working assumption, a resolution, recommendation, that this um, uh, decision be noted and agreed by the authority. Anyone who would uh, not agree with that? Ria, you want to come in? It was just, I think, um, Councillor Arnold would, would like to make a comment. Okay. 
The comment was just that the LGA training I attended earlier this year in February was of an excellent standard and very helpful in um, leading me on to the leadership course that it was uh, I was involved with. Thank you. It's what we make these things are, you know, what we make of it. They offered to do a training course on scrutiny and being a better member, and we offered to hold that in Merseyside, which we did, and it was pretty well received. There's lots of other stuff. Um, we had the fire commission last Friday. It was virtual. Uh, we were able to speak with the minister. I questioned the minister. Others questioned the minister. The shadow spokesman was involved in the pre-meeting. You know, um, the LGA are our, um, our embassy in London, if we used it that way. There's lots of other stuff, but I mean, for, for, for now, are there any other any other members who'd like to question or make a comment? If not, again, the, the proposition is that this be agreed. Uh, I'm taking that as a recommendation. If there are any contrary uh, thoughts, please indicate. Okay, we'll take that uh, item four as agreed by the authority. Now, item five is the service delivery plan. Uh, and I think, Chief, are you going to speak to the service delivery plan? I am, Chair. <coughs> uh, so the recommendation of this report is that members consider and approve the attached service delivery plan in Appendix A and the station plans in on. Appendix 2 for 2021. Prior to, uh, prior to publication onto the uh, authority's website, and obviously you can see the report on the screen. Um, so... Members will be familiar, the service delivery plan includes um, references to RMP action plan, the functional plans, the equality objectives of the service, station plans and performance indicators, and they are all contained within the service delivery plan as stated. Uh, and this plan, on this occasion in this report, uh, uses an estimate in relation to the end of year performance um, against our benchmark performance indicators. And um, what I would also draw members' attention to, it's the the station plans are contained within the service delivery plan and this year is the first year that we've allocated each station a thousand pound to a fund which we've called the community impact fund which is being generated through the external utilization of our stations by private partners alongside some corporate sponsorship so what we in fact we've done is is seek to utilize that money through our staff albeit COVID-19 has, has restricted that a little at this moment in time but firefighters, you know, crew managers, watch managers on station will utilise that money based on their, set, their station plans to deliver better outcomes for the communities that they serve. So I ask members to, to just focus in from page 45 is the, the service delivery plan starts. There is a little bit of background details in regards to Merseyside and the kind of the makeup of Merseyside. But I'll probably particularly draw members' attention to page 62 uh, and 63 which talks about our performance um, to date, and apologies for the images scrolling. Um, and you'll see from the, the pages that I've identified, the performance of the service is very strong, uh, and we are on target against the targets that we set for that year um, across all but a small number of areas. So if we move on to page 63, um, there's, we are looking like it is likely that we will miss the target in relation to the number of road traffic collisions uh, and the number of fatalities on the roads. What I would suggest to members is our focus has been particularly on young people between the ages of 60 and 25, where some of our educational uh, material has been really focused. The target and the, and the missing of the targets is related to all um, road traffic collisions and fatalities on the, the roads. Uh, and as a result, some of that stuff was in our gift to effect and some of it less so. So it's likely members will consider changed targets next time around, which will actually directly uh, reflect the work that we are undertaking in that particular area. And then the other area where the target has been missed or is likely to be missed, given the fact that these are estimates, is in relation to sickness absence. Uh, and it's self-evidently, this includes data related to COVID-19. Um, but to give some members some little reassurance, um, based on the most recent figures that we've received, it's likely that we will only just miss that target 
a 4% sickness absence. And it's likely that you know, our end point will be uh, 4.05. Um, and actually, without the issues related to COVID-19, we would be with green and within the target that has been set. Um, and I'm happy to take specific details around the impacts of COVID-19 on the service if required. Uh, as we move then through the report, as I stated, it goes on to talk about the, um, the actions associated with the integrated risk management plan and the equality and diversity objectives and the actions which are taken and then draws and concludes with the service uh, delivery plan and the station plans particularly. And members will recognise the fact that each one of the station plans is actually bespoke to the station area. It's not a generic response. And so the likes of Liverpool City, where there's a heightened level of risk due to high rise um, premises and so on, we would focus more around um, protection audits rather than necessarily some of the, the wider activity uh, and likes of Formby or Southport, where there's a high level of, of vulnerability due to age, um, we would focus our attention to addressing that vulnerability through the likes of a home fire safety check and a safe and well visit. So the station plans are bespoke to a particular area, which is reflective of the needs of that particular community. So I'll pause at that point, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions around the service delivery plan. Uh, but the recommendation is that members consider and approve the service delivery plan um, and the station plans for publication on the website. Thank you, Chief. Um, uh, and thank you to all of those um, uh, at HQ or remotely these days and at the fire stations who've been involved in uh, the service delivery plan of the IRMP. These are our major planning and management documents. Some of the targets, I mean, how, you know, what control do we have over you know, road accidents and things like that. These are um, planning targets rather than hard targets. We, we know that, we've dealt with that year in, year out. It's a massive document. It's split down into each of the districts. And I think that if, if members, maybe after the event, after today, if they, if they more spend a little bit more time looking at the element of the the, the plan which deals with their own districts and uh, and take some sort of responsibility for that that would be useful um uh, i like to see this this is part of the suite of documents also that we would be tested on submit to the inspectorate as well i think they will really have seen an authority that has a document in this detail this depth tried and tested changing evolving with the circumstances the world changed eight weeks ago and we will have to take into account the you know the new reality after those eight weeks i, I think um it, it's it's a it's a great plan a, a marvelous uh, set of information needs to be you know taken by each authority so what i'm going to do now is ask uh, if any members have any points or questions that they'd like to uh, Yeah, I think so it's Angela Coleman, is it? Yeah. Hang on. I'm just putting my video on. Oh, right. My video is not starting. Can you hear me? You could. We can hear you, though. You could. We can hear you. Oh, right. Okay. I can do it now. There you go. Okay. Well, you're there. Hello. Hello. Um, I just want to ask. Um, it's about the RMIP or R I M P. Sorry. Um. Basically, has anything from the original RIMP changed because of the COVID response? Um, I mean, I'm talking about, in particular, the um, tri-party agreement with the added work streams that have gone into it. I just want to check whether any of that has been carried forward into the RM IRMP, um, because I know there was some there was some discussion about whether or not that was appropriate that we'd had. Um, and I'm just want to make sure that um, anything that's changed does go through the normal negotiation channels with the interested parties, basically. Yeah, nothing, nothing has changed in, re in respect of the integrated management plan that has remained uh, the same throughout. And uh, obviously, which is detailed in the report as it currently stands as an update against all um, RMP action points 
Uh, what Councillor uh, Coleman is referring to is some of the ongoing dialogue that's happened nationally with the uh, Fire Brigade Union, which has resulted in a number of tripartite agreements, which is at the probably uh, a, a very strategic level in relation to supporting communities through COVID-19. Um, and there is at this moment 12 additional activities which are being delivered across uh, the UK in, in different kind of stages and at different levels with potentially an additional uh, couple of activities to be included over the next uh, seven days. Uh, and those activities include things like um, firefighters delivering food, food parcels, uh, packing food for uh, vulnerable individuals, dropping off prescriptions, um, some of our volunteers, not only firefighters, but prevention staff, people in headquarters have made themselves available. So we've got staff who are, who are providing face fit testing for Northwest Ambulance Service so they can wear the right, right and correct PPE um, and ensure that it's been fitted appropriately for the actions that they're taking. Uh, and so that's extended across uh, the UK Fire and Rescue Service in regards to that that kind of you know, strategic conversation with uh, with certainly one of the trade unions and, and ongoing conversations with the other two. Can I just ask um, another question as well? Um, oh, we... oh, oh, the mercy. Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to ask just a, a follow up question. Yep. Are the plans, are we still carrying on with the recruitment programme and are the plan bills and um, adaptations to the current fire stations? Are they going to continue as well? Yeah, absolutely. That they're contained within the integration management plan. So the numbers, you know, we talked about the recruitment of 60 individuals year on year for the course of at least the next what, three, four, five years. They are continuing, um, albeit with some social distancing. It's a little bit more difficult in regards to the recruitment strategy. So bringing people in in the first instance, interviewing them for a role, but then rolling out the actual uh, training program. But that is continuing that would give us some problems in the longer term if we weren't doing that. Uh, and in relation to the build program, so the one outstanding, so go massive being completed now, the one outstanding really is in relation to St. Helens. Mm. Uh, and that is being delayed slightly um, given the implications around COVID-19 on the, the ability to bring um, trades in to continue to support the build, but it's only slightly. So we are anticipating the build of St. Helens to conclude um, in the latter part of this year. Thank you. The Merseyside Integrated Risk Management Plan is a multi-year plan. Um, the tripartite agreements are really more about some time limited departures from the normal grey book. Um, I've monitored that and, and the chief and you know the Fire Services Management Committee, quite a number of those implications only apply to or mainly apply to retained duty system um the the expanding of the work that could apply to everybody there's been a number of things that have been dealt with like pensions and the the payment of um uh, uh, premiums and and so forth which only really apply to retained duty of which we don't really have any so um, you know, we've been looking at what's happening with the national agreements uh, in the context of what we have in Merseyside as well. Have you had your questions answered, Councillor Coleman? Yeah, I have. Um, I've, can I come back in later? There is a question about mental health that I want to bring up as well. Oh, right. I'm happy for other people to, to have their turn first. I've got uh, Councillor Spurrell. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great, yes. thank you. Um, I've got um, three questions, if that's okay. Um, so I'll tell you them all, but obviously if you miss one, let me know. Um, the first one, in terms of the um, service delivery plan, the um, allowance for local stations to have money to do projects, I think is really great. I really welcome that idea. Um, getting a localised response. I just want to check that there was an encouragement for the um, the officers, the staff to work with councillors and local groups to make sure that, you know, where it's relevant, it's kind of embedded in the community and things like that. And I'm sure a lot of them will do that. Um, but obviously, that'd be great if that could be linked in. Um, in terms of the actual performance indicators, um, I've got two thoughts about this. One of them in terms of the targets that we're setting, if you could just explain a bit more about how we set those targets, because some of them are higher than previous years, than previous years achieved. 
And so it was, it doesn't make sense to me why you'd have a higher target than what we've previously achieved. Um, so if you could just clarify some of that. Um, and also, if there's a way that we can get some comparisons to other similar forces. Um, and obviously, I know Merseyside has some quite unique challenges, um, but it'd just be helpful to see whether uh, when we're tracking tables like this and we're looking at kind of the, 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 the uh, view for the going forward, how does it compare to other similar um, uh, IRSQ authorities and organisations? Yeah, okay, absolutely. In relation to that, so I'll answer them in, in, if I can in, uh, in order. In relation to the to the thousand pound, that's exactly what it's there for. It's there to encourage um, the firefighters on those stations in the delivery of their plan to look up and look out. So, um, particularly important that they engage the community in regards to meeting uh, what are potentially challenges within that community. So, as I say, um, reflective of you know, the different vulnerabilities that exist in particular station areas or the different risks that are exhibited, and they are encouraged to en engage partners in that particular area, uh, community groups in that particular area, and, and councillors as, as well. So absolutely, that is a, a fundamental driver, in effect, for the £1,000 being allocated to each station. In relation to the to the, the targets, yeah, you, you're correct, there's, there's some which are a little higher than they've been previously, but it goes back over the previous maybe five years in regards to tracking the performance. So rather than, I'll give you an example, if we had a particularly wet um, summer period, you might get a, a, a kind of really low figure at one particular point in time when the previous four you know, uh, periods of time we haven't had such a wet summer and, the, you know, and the, the target then needs to be smart so it needs to be you know, pushing, striving to be uh, improved year on year on year but also reflective of particular spikes in performance. So we had a particularly busy 2018 with really extreme hot weather. We had significant amount of you know, small fires over that period and so rather than just you know, be reflective of that one particular year we've gone back over the last five years to inform the target so it's stretching and it's, it's challenging but sometimes on occasion it may be a little higher than the previous one okay so that's it and th there has been some uh, work done on that and so we can certainly recirculate the information which informs members about how the targets are reached in the first instance and in regards to benchmarking, yeah, we do benchmark against other fire and rescue services. Certainly the HMI report does a little bit of that as well. Um, but again, part and parcel, maybe the scrutiny arrangements that the authority have, I think it would be absolutely you know, sensible and prudent to kind of to, to draw it in on how do we as a metropolitan fire and rescue service compare with other metropolitan fire and rescue services as a, a kind of a similar group. Um, and how does that reflective of the challenges that Merseyside faces and again, again in relation to other services, heightened levels of deprivation as members now uh, result in a higher number of incidents um, and serious behaviour fires or actually accidental dwelling fires. Um, and so you know, we have to be cognizant of that, but we can put direct comparators in or as best we are able by comparing almost like for like in regards to the, our metropolitan family. So um, more than happy for that to be taken through scrutiny around our benchmark. Uh, indicators and how we stack up against other services in the uh, in, in that family group. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I've got uh, Councillor Barrington and then a note from Councillor Tweed saying that he has to leave at two o'clock. So thank you for joining the meeting, they're all the same. So uh, Councillor Barrington. My video, I don't think, is showing, but you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just wondered with um, the measures of lockdown, if we've seen an increase in accidental dwelling fires with more people spending time at home. Um, it's probably a little too early to tell. Um, some of the kind of the information has been drawn in nationally at this moment in time, and I know that because I've been part and parcel to trying to be agile enough to know whether lockdowns have an, a, an adverse effect on people's fire safety. Um, and so th there's a little bit of work still to be done. What I would say, and again, and it's probably because we're talking small numbers, it can sometimes be a little um, inaccurate to suggest that this is all related to the lockdown, but we've had three fire deaths. Um, between now and you know, 1st of April, um, when you consider that with the last three years, well, say four years, of which we've had five fire deaths in three of those years. 
So to have three within such a short period of time um, gives us some cause to concern and we are monitoring that against the, the, the implications of lockdown. We're not seeing that mirrored across the UK Fire and Rescue Service, hence the reason there's probably a, a bit of trepidation about linking the two things at this moment in time. But actually, when you look at the number of accidental dwelling fires, they are there or thereabouts. They are very similar to the previous year. So that's probably a better indicator of whether lockdown is having a, a, an adverse effect. Um, but we are monitoring that as we, uh, as we go. Hey, thank you. I mean, yes, thank you. There'll probably be people locked in, more dangerous. Nobody out in the cars, fewer car accidents. I mm -hmm. think what we probably need back end of the year is a special session, almost like a bit of a conference of the authority, uh, just to uh, receive reports back from our officers and lessons learned. There's been, uh, you know, none of us have lived through this before. Hopefully none. Our children won't live through this again. But, you know, pandemic and all of the stuff that goes with it, there are lessons to be learned. Now, I've got, um, you know, Councillor Makinson and then coming back to Councillor Coleman, if that's all right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question on page 62 on the performance figures. Uh, just the first one on the number yeah. of emergency calls received. It's quite a dramatic drop um, of 8,000 fewer calls, almost about 28% fall. Is that part of a, a long-term trend? Uh, on the face of it, it, uh, it looks like a good thing, but it could also mean that people are feeling less inclined to call. So it'd be useful if we had some analysis of, uh, of that. Yeah, okay. And, and, and I will provide you with that uh, detailed analysis. Um, it's twofold, really. You know, we're seeing the number of calls diminish, Council, you know, and again, not linking everything to, to COVID-19 um, in any way, shape or form. But as Council Barron said, there's, there's, you know, there's less young people out um, in parks and fields and open spaces. There's also less vehicles on the road too. Um, and whether that's had a, an impact, we've only seen slight increases in the number of uh, calls to automatic fire alarms over the period. The vast majority of incidents have, have diminished over the period of, of, that we've been dealing with COVID-19. Um, but equally, it's, it's down to a significant push and effort uh, around the work that we do to prevent incidents occurring in the first instance. So it's probably better if I break that down in, in a little bit more detail. Um, and particularly if you look at the figures around the number of secondary fires attended, you will see that we've gone from you know, performance in 2018, 19 of 5,276 to an estimated performance of 3,111. Um, and that is, is directly related to the work that we are doing in our communities to prevent those fires occurring. So yes, we have seen over the course of, of, of a number of years um, the number of incidents in certain areas di diminish, decrease. Uh, we've seen some of it plateau, if I'm honest with you. So we, you know, accidental dwelling fires continue to come down. Fire deaths are probably uh, you know, a poor indicator, really, of performance. But the fact of the matter is they've, they've kind of plateaued at probably five fire deaths as it, as it has been in the last um, three out of the four years. Um, and we're seeing some slight increases in some areas. So, as I say, automatic fire alarms. But... You know, this has been a concerted effort by people around the preventative work that we do, uh, but equally there's probably been a, a somewhat of a contributor around um, the amount of, of, of work or the, the, the lack of things that are going on in communities around COVID-19. And then the other thing I would just draw your attention to is, is 2018-19 was when we had that the really hot weather as well. Um, and so we are comparing a particularly you know, or maybe a, a really difficult uh, hot year um, with one where we've performed better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Coleman, you have a supplementary question? Um, yeah. Sorry, the, the video is not working, but uh, as long as you can hear me. Um, so, basically, my yeah. question... Oh, hang on. So my, my question is around mental health, um, in particular related to the current pandemic. Um, we've got a lot of people who are now working from home, who are isolated. Um, you know, the, there's an added anxiety about productivity while you're working at home and so on. Um, so I want to know what we're we doing in terms of, of mental health. Um, 
and whatever strategy we've got I think we should look at kind of beefing it up a little bit maybe making it a little bit more proactive um making sure that everybody's all right there will be people who are already stressed out and anxious before this has happened and now they're actually working from home alone away from people away from their support structures um so it's just a, a, a question mark around our strategy and how we can beef it up um or even if it's just signposting people i don't know whether we have um some sort of outside service that that provides counseling and, and if so could we have um an idea about how many people access that service um, and we we're just talking about frontline staff we talk about back office staff as well um uh, it'd be useful to know how many people are actually accessing without obviously knowing who they are just straightforward numbers and um, to see how we can make sure that our our staff and the workforce are supported as much as possible throughout this yeah okay um and I, I stand to be corrected by what I'm going to say now, but I don't think there's a better fire and rescue service in the UK that look after the well-being of its staff. Um, and so since uh, obviously you know, individuals are, and you're right, saying number of self-isolating given the, the fall into the at-risk categories, uh, you know, um, but line managers have been keeping in contact with those individuals and members will be aware, and I'll probably touch on this in in a more latter report about the kind of the levels of communication that have been flowing out um, and we've also got a, an arrangement in place where we can provide text messages to staff to keep them abreast of what's going on but actually if you look at the mainstream to what we normally have available under the, the normal circumstances um, if, the, if I can say that around the well-being of our staff we've got significant arrangements in place and that does extend to employee, employee assistance uh, outside of the service where individuals and their families for that matter if it's affecting their ability to come into work and their well-being can kind of contact those services for advice and support and you know, and under certain circumstances uh, some counselling we also have that provision in-house and we have our own occupational health support um, and if you, you know, refer back to the um, inspector of reports of, of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service in relation to uh, the, the places where they felt we were outstanding and performed really highly was absolutely uh, focused in on the well-being of our staff and um, so and again just small anecdotes really we've had a number of um, individuals who unfortunately um, and Les referenced it earlier on as he opened up the, the meeting of the authority who've lost parents over the course of the last um, number of weeks I've spoken to those individuals personally um, and so I think that we've got a fire and rescue service and individuals who work in this at every level who care, can care passionately about the individuals who are employed in the service. I think we've got the, the most robust uh, welfare arrangements in place of any fire and rescue service in the UK. I'm always real happy to kind of to learn and, and improve in those areas. And so if there's any thoughts or ideas about how we can do that, uh, it may, you know, it, I'm, I'm very open to, to kind of to exploring them. But I think I'll you know, provide members with the assurance that we have got some really quality arrangements in place and quality individuals who are providing support to those individuals who are uh, isolated. Um, and you know, so much so that we've had a, a survey gone out more latterly. Is there anything else we can do for you to provide you with some support while you are away? Um, but we are keeping in close contact with those individuals um, on, a, on a regular basis to make sure that they're not feeling isolated from the workplace. Um, so, um, I'm happy, I always will be happy to kind of explore other additional things that we can do, but I'm pretty confident that we've got some really robust arrangements in place. Okay, that's, that's great. That we, I know that we've, we've got really good arrangements currently, but um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we're in uncharted waters here. This is like, you know, an entire workforce, back office staff and so on, working from home. I mean, I suppose all of us here in this meeting are working from home and I can speak from experience. I've found it quite difficult as well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy with what you're saying that you, you, there are arrangements in place, but I just want to know whether or not, whether or not we could be more proactive about this, because I know, I know there's been um, an increase in people accessing um, emergency um, mental health assistance over this um, crisis and pandemic and obviously that means that there will be 
members of this workforce as well who are who are involved who who are needing extra assistance um so it, you know could we look at how many people are accessing that assistance employee assistance and um, for a start off and then see how we could be more proactive and i'm quite happy to be sort of like be involved in this as much as possible yeah great and look and, and we've, you know, two bits of that is yes absolutely and we'd love to have you involved uh, council coleman um, the, the bits will just put a survey out, as I said, which is asking those kind of questions. You know, how are you? And is there anything else we can do for you? So that information will be useful and informing any any next steps which we can we can utilise. And in relation to the employee assistance program, yeah, absolutely, I can provide you with the with the numbers of individuals who are accessing those services. And as I said, it's not just necessarily down to the individual. We also recognise that. It can be their family, and if your family are not feeling great at any particular moment in time, that can have an adverse effect on our employees. So, uh, so yeah, absolutely, we can share that level of, of information, and that can inform our next steps. And as I say, I'd love to get you involved. So, so fantastic, no problem. Thank you. I mean, in in my when this kicked off, uh, one of the earliest discussions Phil and I had was about not working from home, but agile working it's more than just you're at home now just stay there it's about a whole different way of working and this is probably for the long term in an ideal world um, rather than a lockdown world people could go into offices at our fire stations work remotely in different ways come in one day two days a week meet with their colleagues and 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 all the other stuff that goes on um, some years ago the authority said that it wanted to give the mental health of its team, of its staff, very high, very high priority. And in my discussions with FBU at the national level, I think it is recognised that there's few people putting the amount of time and investment in. But I think this is what I was saying before. We probably need a session about lessons learned later in the year and working with our staff helping them to work in an agile way rather than just you're working from home now it's not just working from home it's working in a different way and we have to think about people's um, mental well-being as well we actually do have in the uh, last item item 10 there's some more implications of the covid19 specifically we can pick up some of those issues later on if you'd like to as well yeah and chair and you reference some um People and organisational development policies there as well, which absolutely reflect um, you know, positive mental health and well-being, uh, and some of the measures that we're putting in place to ensure the, uh, the well-being of our staff now and in the longer term too. So we'll maybe make reference back to them again in a second. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And then I've got Lynn Thompson, and incidentally, I'm picking this up from the chat list. People are sending in the request by on the chat list, so if there are members who haven't picked that up and aren't looking at the chat page, there's a few bits and pieces there as well. Uh, so, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me, Mother? <laughs> Just touching on the point of the mental health issues in the wider community, I've got nothing but praise for the Fire Authority because social media messages that are coming out almost every other day, particularly with mental health, I've found invaluable. I'm part of a number of community groups, like I'm sure most councillors are, uh, COVID-19 groups, and it's been fantastic. So I, I do echo what the Chief said. I think within the organisation and outside as well, I think others can learn from the authority. So I just wanted to put that um, on record. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Looking at the time, and you know, Councillor Tweed would have left by now, but um, can I say that we're looking at, looking at the service delivery plan? Uh, the recommendation is members consider and approve the attached service delivery plan, Appendix 1, Station Plan Appendix 2, prior to publication on the authority's website. I'm going to recommend that that is agreed. Uh, if anybody uh, would like uh, to put a contrary view, the time is now. Hello. Nobody's indicating. Um, so I'm going to presume that that item uh, is agreed.
so that we'll move on to uh, appendix item six, corporate risk register 2019-20, um, October to March update. That's page 143 to 212. And this is in the hands of the chief, I do believe. Yeah, um, and, and Chair, I won't necessarily scroll through the corporate risk register unless anyone wants me particularly to take them to a, a reference point. However, the purpose of the report is to inform members of the current risks contained within the corporate risk register and the state of those risks and associated control measures, including any updates uh, between the periods of October and March 2020. Um, and the recommendation being that members approve uh, the updated corporate risk register, which incorporates the, the current uh, status of those risks. Um, and without going into the, the register specifically, I just reference a, a number of kind of key points. Um, the risk relating to the building of the new fire station at Soro Massey, which I referenced previously, has been removed from the register now, given that the, the building has been completed uh, and signed across to the to the service. Uh, it's been really well received by the operational crews that operate within it, but also uh, particularly well received by the, uh, the, the, the communities of Sorgo Massey too, which is a, is a real positive. Um, in relation to the addition of a new risk, a new risk has been added, and that's in relation to the potential implications of the McLeod pensions judgment. Uh, and, and that's on the basis of the Court of Appeal ruling that the transitional protections afforded to older members and when the firefighters pension scheme um, and local government pension scheme was constituted was unlawful on the basis of discrimination and as a result that there is potential uh, financial risk to the authority in the longer term dependent on the, the resolution which is um, being um, clarified as we speak so it's been added to the risk register in that regard and then also just references you know self-evidently we are in the in the throes of a COVID-19 pandemic uh, and there are a number of um, risks which have, have been identified more broadly by the you know, by the, the service, which have got now specific references to COVID-19 in, and those areas have been re refreshed as a result. Uh, so they're the kind of the key risks removed and, and risks added in, to reflect where we are currently at in regards to corporate risk register. But I'm happy to take any specific questions, Chair, more broadly on any particular element of the risk register. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tweed is staying with us. Uh, I think I've got um, uh, Councillor Sparrell who's asked a question. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask about, uh, it's page 165, it's one of the earlier ones. It's the only one that still remains red after mitigation, um, which is the EU, uh, you know, Brexit impact on supplies and things like that. And it does say in the update that obviously um, nobody really knows anything and people are doing everything they can to, to keep supply. I just wondered if you had any updates around the kind of national conversations and any support or kind of, I mean, I guess maybe it's all on hold with COVID, but are the government kind of going to assure us that we'll get what we need once we do leave, if we struggle to obtain it through the usual uh, supply chains? Um. I suppose the I suppose that's an ongoing challenge for us in regards to Brexit and and so on. I think what what draw into COVID nineteen and over the course of the the last what is almost twelve weeks, I think now we're, we're into in regards to our response to COVID nineteen. It's required to to secure significant amounts of personal protective equipment, not only for Mersey side, funnily enough, but um, through the the national picture around securing some of that PPE for. Um, for the rest of the UK Fire and Rescue Service. And that actually demand has changed over the course of the last number of weeks because some of the PPE we didn't necessarily utilise, but some of the tasks that how uh, the Fire and Rescue Service has taken on has, has required us to look at the PPE a little differently. Um, and we, have, we, Merseyside, have been particularly working with Kent and the Procurement Hub. Uh, and the Procurement Hub have opened up a significant number of additional supply chains for us. Um, and so, on the on, you know, on the back of that relationship and that developing relationship over the course of the last number of weeks, I'm assured that we will be able to kind of continue to secure um, kit and equipment and personal protective equipment in regards to additional supply chains and working collaboratively as a sector. And um, is there still challenges around you know the implications of Brexit around the access to um, kit and equipment? Yes, there is. Um, but at this moment in time, I probably have to 
suggest that I'm not in a position to say what they are yet, um, only to reassure you, councillors, for all that. You know, we've got now really strong working relationships with are alive to the issues and have opened up a significant number of supply chains really effectively in a very short period of time to ensure that we've got the right kit and equipment available to us. So you know, we will continue to uh, work on that relationship post COVID-19 uh, to ensure that it's embedded across our work and practice. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Council Coleman's asked, um, can, you know, can we have a, an update on uh, Newtony Willows yesterday, which was, it's not on the agenda, I would normally have asked uh, the chief at the end of the meeting for members just to make a few comments, just to let everybody know. I know I've had a conversation both yesterday and today with the chief this morning before the meeting started. He's given me some information regarding the well-being of our staff. But if we get the chance at the end of the meeting, after the formal agenda, to just cover a few of those points in brief, then yeah, we may yeah. take the chance to do so. So then there's Andrew, Councillor Andrew Makinson. Thank you, Chair. The register has a number of risks relating to um, the, the risk of falling behind in training in a range of key skills. How much greater is that risk in the current environment, particularly if the lockdown uh, lasts for the rest of the year, as is possible? Uh, I'm guessing there's a lot of skills that simply can't be, can't be learned or refreshed online. So how are we coping with, with those things? Yeah. And, and Defer back to um, probably comments around recruitment and continuing with our recruitment. Some services have chosen to, to pause that. Actually, the demand placed on the workforce and maintaining fire engine availability at a future point in time, I would suggest is, is a long term priority and hence the reason why we have chosen to continue with our recruitment uh, on our recruit courses, albeit they look a little differently. They are, you know, there is social distancing required. They are not the same as they were, but the levels of input. Um, and the quality of training remains uh, robust. Uh, and we have focused in particularly on risk critical training. So if we were to, to choose between you know, something which we defined as non risk critical, but just beneficial, that, that, that training has been put on hold potentially. Uh, and then we are focused in on the risk criticality of the work that we do. So breathing apparatus, dealing with road traffic collisions, working from height and so on and so forth. So we've focused our work particularly around those areas and actually, you know, funny enough, and we're utilising something which you know, is, is new to, to the service, but we, you know, the utilisation of technology, you've, you've talked about you know, uh, you know, learning, fire, um, you know, different media, we've, we've started to employ that more effectively than we have ever done now. So we have LearnPro, which is an electronic learning platform, which we've utilised uh, to, 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 to greater extent than we have done previously. It doesn't, in my view, uh, negate the need to do some you know, hands-on training, but the fact of the matter is we're prioritising risk-critical uh, training. The non-risk-critical, we've, we've kind of stalled, given the, the circumstances we're facing, but we continue to, to train, um, and that one of our strategic objectives from the outset was to maintain the skills competencies of our firefighters, because what would be worse is if one of our firefighters got injured because they they were out of ticket or they were no longer competent in a particular area. So that maintains a priority for the service. Thank you. And, and I think our role, or more particularly Phil's role there as National Gold Commander, we operate the National Resilience Board from Merseyside. We are heavily involved with the strategic resilience. I think this will put Merseyside particularly in a very strong position. If we can ever shake the can and get the government to sub, you know, give us some money for national delivery of training to improve uh, our, the capital investment in our training centre, wherever that be within Merseyside. I think this has been a disaster for the nation, but there are issues there that Merseyside have led on that will put us in quite a strong position when we come back to whatever the new world of fire is. Thank you. Um, I've got no more uh, indications from members um, on the corporate risk register. So the corporate risk register recommendation is that members approve the updated corporate risk register 2019-20, which incorporates the current status of those risks to March 2020. And that's where the world changed. Uh, so the recommendation is that that be agreed unless anyone indicates to the contrary. 
I'm not seeing anything. So I'll, for the record, I'll mark that down as agreed. So then the next item is agenda item seven, which is uh, the uh, inspector's report and self-assessment 2020. Uh, over to the chief. Yeah, Chair, I'll, I will be very quick in relation to this report, given the fact that it's probably now a little dated in regards to the information contained within and actually it's, it's intended audience. So the report itself is, um, the, the, well, the, the, it's request that members note the content of the, um, the HMI inspection self-assessment template for Merseyside Fire and Risk Service as done some, some months ago now, um, and that members note the, the self-assessments prepared by the Chief Officer and submitted to the HMI CFRS. But that also members note that the self-assessment was produced and submitted earlier in the year as a precursor to inspection uh, and before the cessation of the inspection process due to COVID-19. Um, and members will be aware that our inspection was scheduled for, for between the 6th and 27th of July, um, but that was suspended on the back of the COVID-19. And we have yet to have a clear date on whether, whether and when the inspection program uh, will be recommenced. Um, and so as a result of that, really what we will have to do on the basis of the cessation of the inspection program is to resubmit a revised self-assessment template with potentially some additional information in uh, which probably reflects the last number of weeks um, and i know in some of the discussions that have been had nationally it may well be that a focus of the inspectors next time around may be a little bit more thematic in regards to its its, its first um rollout or, or re-establishment and that may look at the business continuity arrangements that have been put in place by services in respect of COVID-19. If that's the case, I think the authority are in a strong place, but it would certainly result in a revised self-assessment being submitted. So really this report was just about thoroughness and completeness uh, of the information that we had provided to the inspectors, but it's highly likely we will have to resubmit um, a further document uh, when the inspection programme uh, recommences. Happy to take any questions, Chair, but I'm not sure um, there's, there's, there's much to add other than that. It's a status report, really. The, the inspectors has gone into lockdown. Our, our key liaison officer would have changed. It, that might have changed again. But if you look at the document that we submitted and the number of what have you done since we last inspected you, major 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 changes alterations improvements rolling adaptations uh so i think uh you know that would have put us in a very strong position anyway but i think that from the inspector the whole world has changed as well so are there any um are there any uh questions uh coming from members uh about the rolling uh inspection program okay. that has been indicated chair who, who's that? Oh, just, none have been indicated. Thank none you. have been indicated. No, there's no, in, no. Uh, indication. So the recommendation here is members note 2020 inspection self-assessment prepared by the chair, submitted inspectorate. I'm trying to just say inspectorate rather than a great long mouthful of letters. As part of round two, members note the self-assessment produced and submitted earlier than the COVID-19. So again, the recommendation is that that item be agreed unless anybody indicates. I'm having no indications, so I'll take that as agreed. We move on to agenda item eight, HR policies, pages 227 to 250, again in the hands of the chief. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Again, it's just references to you know, the question posed previously by Councillor Coleman around an overall arching wellbeing policy. But uh, and, and a number of other policies which relate to recruitment, promotions and bereavement. Um, but the purpose of the report is to advise members of the newly developed policies created to reflect changes in national legislation alongside the delivery of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority's people strategy, where people are at the kind of the centre of the work that we do. Um, and then the recommendations is that we approve the policies in Appendix A, B, C and approve the, the service instruction in Appendix D, which includes a commitment to continue to pay uh, an employee their normal salary rather than the statutory prescribed amount for any per period of parental bereavement, which again, I think is a, is a reflection on, on, on behalf of the authority about the 
the kind of value we place in, in our staff. Um, and you know, the I'll just highlight some of the kind of the, the key elements of the policies themselves. The overarching wellbeing policy outlines the authority's commitment to employee wellbeing and describes the various support mechanisms in place to enable our employees to work towards a healthy work-life balance. Um, in regards to the recruitment policy, the recruitment policy sets out the organization's intent of attracting and recruiting a diverse workforce that reflects our communities uh, and the communities which we serve. Um, and again, members will be aware if they refer back to the HMIC FRS report, which you know, the amount of female firefighters in Merseyside is, is, you know, is second only to Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service in regards to the percentage of female firefighters. Uh, currently operating in Merseyside and actually if you look at the kind of the, the makeup of our firefighters in relation to uh, BAME uh, against the residential population, you know, Merseyside has performed the best in regards to the diversity of, of BAME firefighters with the exception of the Islands of Scilly which um, I probably exclude for the purposes of, of this report back to the authority um, and that is that was on the basis of the, the inspectorate report some time back if you now looked at the figures in, in respect of the work that we've undertaken since, um, we've seen increases in relation to uh, those figures. So we've now got 10.93% of our operational staff are, are now women, um, and we were reporting back at 9% previously. Uh, and we've now got 6.2% are BAME against a, a percentage of 6% as we were previously reporting back. So again, we have not stood still. We continue to... Um, to improve the diversity of the workforce to reflect our communities. It moves on to a promotions policy, which sets out the broad principles of how we would promote and how we would ensure succession plans are in place. And then, as I suggested, the bereavement service instruction has been developed in, in response to statutory parental bereavement leave regulations, um, which move us on to providing two full weeks pay for, of leave for employees who suffer bereavement of a child under 18. Um, but we've also sought to now realign some of the bereavement arrangements. So officers have also reviewed existing bereavement leave arrangements and proposed as part, part of this new instruction to increase the amount of paid leave granted for staff who suffer bereavement of a close family member from three days to a full week or a full tour of duty. This approach uh, brings the authority in line with other organisations, but more importantly, reflects the commitment to, and support of our staff through uh, challenging times. Um, I'll play pause at that point, Chair, and happy to take questions on the specific policies or more broadly on the, the, the comments that I've made to date. I was very pleased to read this in the agenda, these uh, service plans. Uh, I was, um, uh, you know, um, quite impressed by that. So I've got a, a note here from Councillor Grace. Uh, yeah, it's a very broad question, really. I know um, there's been a huge amount of work done for equality and diversity. It was all ticking along really well. And obviously, um, the totally unpredicted uh, uh, COVID has taken over. Um, and I know there's a very uncertain future for us all. But while I can see that things will carry on in the fire service, I was wondering about things like the, we're hoping for a visit from the um, Asian firefighters whether that's, that could, would still or could still be a possibility. Yeah, the, we were expecting the Asian Fire Rescue, Fire Rescue Association uh, conference to be hosted in mm. Merseyside, you know, the, the tail end of December. They've actually approached us and asked if they can put it back. Yeah, um, I wonder if that was, yeah. It was an, a, another Fire and Rescue Service. So Kent Fire and Rescue Service were, were doing a conference uh, probably about this time. Uh, and what they've asked is if we can shove shovel them all along so you know Kent remains the next conference to be delivered uh, and so they would move into either the December slot or into 2021 but be assured uh, Councillor Grace you know absolutely fully committed to ensuring that that conference takes place in Merseyside uh, and so it will still take place in Merseyside it's just that we may be moved on maybe six to twelve months. That's great I, I was just concerned that it, it possibly had to uh, have been cancelled. Lovely, thank no, you no. very much. Thank you. So, uh, I've got no more indications. I think when we go, as members, to the recruit passing out, what I'd like to just look at and see 
how many female, how many BAME, are we getting a, are we getting a mix, particularly in our new recruitment um, you know, cadre cohort? And I think that is a job for us as members. We have a legal responsibility to promote equality and diversity. And one of the ways as members is to look at every recruit course and see how we're doing and also ask questions about retain, retention and also on there as well about promotion and ensuring that our great you know, people come through the ranks and get the proper promotion that they deserve. So I'm just going to ask uh, on HR policies, are there any other questions from uh, uh, members? Nobody's indicating. So I'm going to then uh, go to the recommendation. Recommended that members approve policies attached in appendix is A, B and C. And the instruction in appendix D, uh, which is a commitment to pay employees, etc. I'm going to recommend that that be uh, agreed, unless there is any note to the contrary. I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to assume that that is agreed for the minute. We can move on to item nine, which is um, more of a discussion or uh, a briefing on the fire safety bill, which is in Parliament, which is on pages 251 and is also in the hands of the Chief. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Again, you, you, you're quite right. It's probably more of a briefing document, really, uh, based on the fact that the fire safety bill is, is currently being considered. Uh, but the purpose of the report is to inform the authority of the progress of the fire safety bill and its current objectives and the potential impact uh, as transitions in the law or transitions change into law, um, and to inform the authority of the additional government grant funding provided fire and rescue service to support uh, that protection work. And then the recommendation is that authority members note the report itself. Uh, and you know, it goes without saying, you know, there's been a significant amount of focus on protection activity uh, since June, two, uh, June 14th, 2017, uh, when the Glenfell Tower fire occurred. And as a result of that, um, on the 19th of March 2020, the government introduced the Fire Safety Bill uh, to form part of that response. Uh, and it's part of a series of changes by the government to both fire safety and building safety with further primary and secondary legislation to follow. Uh, the fire safety bill amends the regulatory form order and aims to deliver greater clarity over responsibility for fire safety in buildings containing more than one home. So again, self-evidently directly linked to Glenfell Tower fire. Uh, and the second reading of the bill took place on the 29th of April uh, 2020. Fire safety order applies to all non-domestic premises, including communal areas and residential buildings with multiple homes. And it's designed, you know, and the fire safety order designates those in control of those premises as responsible for the fire safety and they have a duty to undertake assessments and manage that risk. And that is, as we know, enforced by the fire authority. Uh, but what was self-evident over the course of the inquiry was the lack of clarity uh, within the existing fire safety order over enforcement responsibility regarding the building structure, external walls and certain common parts. The government undertook a call for evidence in 2019, which we as Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority contributed to, to inform amendments to uh, the said uh, fire safety order as required by the fire safety bill. Um, a second bill, the building safety bill, proposes new and enhanced regulatory regimes for building safety and construction processes and ensures residents have a stronger voice in that system that bill is yet to be published, but it, but it will later on in the in the year. Uh, and the government will also establish a new national building safety regulator within the HSE, so you know health and safety expect, expected, um, executive, sorry, uh, responsible for, for implementing and enforcing a more stringent regime for high rise residential premises, providing uh, a wider oversight of safety and performance. Uh, and to enable some of that work to take place and to assist fire and rescue services who have been at uh, pains to say that, you know, that, that that's lovely, that there's more legislative powers, but we require some additional financial support, uh, recognising that there's a bigger burden being placed on the service. Um, the money was released to uh, services um, and Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service will receive just over £524,000 to support that work equating to 20 million pound nationally. There is one caveat to that though, is the fact that is only one year worth of grant funding 
and it is focused in on uh, the 11,000 premises that have been identified as being uh, particularly at risk and vulnerable because they are 18 metres in height. Um, and again, some of that kind of key focus will be around providing assurance in those particular areas uh, with London having a significantly higher number of those premises than elsewhere. But we will utilise that grant effectively. It will be directed and ring fenced specifically for protection uh, activities and it will enhance the work that we are currently undertaking. Uh, and going back probably a, a number of months now, it just reinforces the point that we made to members when we split prevention and protection previously under one area manager um, and you know, have designated a, an area manager role specifically to look at uh, protection, the implementation of the Dame Judith Hackett review recommendations and our response to uh, the Grenfell Tower fire. So again, some, some significant work there. It is a bill, it is moving through the, the house um, and we are um, assured that we will continue to provide some support in those areas, particularly given the grant funding, but we will be pressing government for that funding to be uh, continued and ongoing. And I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, yes. Uh, uh, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, so I, I watched a bit of this um, debate at a second reading in uh, on the Parliament channel. Uh, I, I was in, so I didn't have much else to do. Uh, and it was, I'm, I'm glad that this bill has been introduced. Um, I think it's right that we, you know, now is a good time to introduce an update to um, to fire regulations in the country. Um, I have to say, I, I didn't think there was a great deal to the bill. Um, in fact, if you if you look at it now on page two, six, eight, um, the third clause isn't really anything, and the first clause is that this is an update to a, to an existing bill, and the, the second clause is um, that we will give delegated powers uh, to create regulations at a later point. Um, I've always been of the opinion that when you're presenting legislation. Uh, you should come forward with like a package of measures uh, that you're proposing uh, rather than, um, I suppose, hoping that people will come up with good suggestions at the committee stage or uh, that the minister can just, you know, pass whatever they want at a later stage. Um, one of the problems with regulations uh, being introduced later by a relevant Secretary of State is that they're very difficult to stop. Um, so if a Secretary of State decides to pass something, then the only way to stop it is by laying a prayer in Parliament. It's using a piece of very old-fashioned parliamentary procedure. Um, so regulations tend to get passed very, very easily and they're very difficult to, to change. So rather than what they seem to have done here, which is put forward a bill and then say, oh, and by the way, we'll fill in the bill later. You know, I would have liked to have seen some actual proposals in the bill. Um, there, you know, there are some very simple, basic things they could have put in, which were uh, proposals from the first stage of the, the Grenfell inquiry, um, such as uh, checking fire doors or um, uh, inspecting lifts, those kind of things, but nothing, nothing like that in it. Um, and that could be because the government also proposed a building safety bill, which hasn't gone to second reading yet, and it could well be in there. But for me, those things are so intrinsically linked, I'd have liked to have seen them side by side. Um, so, you know, I, I welcome this bill and I'm, I'm glad it's there and now it is in, in the process of going to committee stage. So this is the chance for us to make some recommendations to, to put pressure on those committee members to introduce amendments. Um, so, you know, what would we like to see? Would we like to see a, um, a sprinkler fund? Uh, you know, would we like to see a better, well, I'm sure we would like to see better funding for, for fire authorities around the country. Um, now is the time to make those suggestions. That's that's everything. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thank I don't you. agree with any of the points well, raised, and you know, members will be aware we've provided some documentation to members, to our local MPs, to the city region leaders in regards to uh, how we think or we th some key recommendations should be uh, taken forward in, in relation to any one of the, the, the bills. To be perfectly honest with you, but I think. You know, Councillor Roberts has been quite clear in, re in respect of, of, of my assumption too, and whether the assumption can kind of, you know, catch you out at times, but we've made reference to the second bill and the building safety bill and assuring ourselves that either in this current arrangement 
for the future one that those issues that we've highlighted previously are addressed and responded to. I mean, you're absolutely right, uh, Councillor Roberts. Um, this is the resounding bang of the stable door slamming after the horse has bolted. The legislation is is thin and it's so oh, well, well we'll put a machine in place and we'll come to it at a later stage actually i questioned luke edwards who is the senior civil servant and i said this extra money is it one-off capital or is it revenue his answer was it, it's largely revenue this side of the comprehensive spending review because of course that question was asked to him a little while ago the csr's off whatever you know. but this was intended to be just interim funding um, to enable fire authorities to deal with the extra cost burdens, new new burdens, of added uh, building safety. I, I said, you know, I, I think, you know, at the um, at the Blackpool conference, as I said at the Blackpool conference, um, the, the this the part of the Grenfell dilemma, the issue, was that the 1972 Fire Precautions Act was scrapped, replaced with an act which pushed off onto other people building safety, the, the responsible person. Uh, we need to review the whole of this. There's sprinklers, 11 meters now, there's houses in multiple occupation, there's fire doors, there's lots of issues. And this is what we've got to do through the LGA and our MPs, lobby for better um, safety. So, are there any uh, are there any other points or comments that people would like to make on the fire safety bill? Yeah, go on. Is there any is there anybody else who'd like to come in? No. Uh, the uh, the recommendation is that the report be noted. I'm assuming that that would be agreed unless I hear to the contrary. Okay. Thank you. So the next is the last item, uh, item 10, implications of COVID-19, pages 277 to 290. Chief. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I should be able to do this one in my sleep, but um, and I probably can. But the purpose of the report is to update members on the actions taken by the service in response to COVID-19 um, pandemic. And the report details the actions taken in response to the pandemic at a national, regional and organisational uh, level. Uh, and the recommendations are that members note the work that has been undertaken nationally to support the fire and rescue service, uh, note the work that has been taken on, you know, locally through the local resilience forum and strategic coordinating group, group in order to support communities, note the work that's been undertaken by the service in order to maintain business continuity and protect the well-being of our staff, uh, note the financial implications related to COVID-19 and note the legal implications uh, related to COVID-19 and one of them has been addressed uh, previously by uh, Ria this, this afternoon. Um, it's, it's clear that the, this has been unprecedented, not only for the Fire and Rescue Service, but for, for others and particularly health colleagues. And I don't underestimate the challenges that have faced um, you know, different countries and, and, and certainly health professionals, those in social care um, and across the partnership. And that's been a real focus of the work that we've done uh, and undertaken in relation to support them as best we are able. And I'll talk about that at not only a strategic level, but a, a, a Merseyside level, uh, and then an organisational one about protecting the wellbeing of our staff. But it's clear from the outset, um, we set some strategic objectives, which were uh, to ensure that we uh, maintained our operational response provision and it remained resilient and effective throughout. Uh, and that could have been impacted on by a number of issues, uh, particularly the loss of key staff uh, based on the development or the transition of the virus um, and so we were very focused in on ensuring that didn't take place. Our second objective is about supporting the broader uh, public sector response to the pandemic, particularly in relation to supporting our local authorities, the NHS and the Ambulance Trust, of which we've done all of those things during the course of the last number of weeks, uh, and maintain the highest levels and standards possible in relation to the health, safety and welfare of our staff. Again, and that's been a uh, certainly a, a moving feast as guidance has changed around public health England advice and, and so on and so forth and we've managed that really really effectively over the period to ensure that staff are protected. 
Uh, so at the at the national level, and I, I don't intend to go into a great amount of detail. I'm happy to take as many questions as, as members would, would would wish to to suggest. Um, but I'll just kind of keep it high level and and and, and relatively low key. Um, nationally, I was asked to uh, become the um, the fire gold for the UK Fire and Rescue Service and, and lead it through this period of, of pandemic. Uh, and that has resulted in a number of, of, of actions which have been generated, which are captured on page 279, um, paragraph 16, which pretty much sums up where we are we have been at and, and how it started and how it's generated uh, the amount of work that it has up until this point. But those, those, those maybe half a dozen actions probably don't uh, tell the true, true story of of what the last 12 weeks have been like for, for Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service particularly. But early on, um, some of the key activities with the identification of, of Fire and Rescue Service staff, and I mean staff, not just firefighters, as critical workers, and that's allowed us to maintain our continuity of services throughout. Um, and, and again, that's easy to say, it's less easy to do, particularly if um, in, the, in the discussions which were taking place at the time. We've also, again, referencing back to my response to Councillor Spurl, um, created and supported the national application of, of, of personal protective equipment and the requirements around public health England guidance. So we set the, the levels of PPE required for our staff. And I was on record very early on into the, into the discussions nationally to say that we were not going to compromise the safety of our staff and our staff were going to have the, the, the right PPE to undertake the tasks that they were being uh, asked to do. And that has maintained the case throughout. And whilst there has been some challenges around personal protective equipment elsewhere, the Fire and Rescue Service, uh, Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service has maintained the levels of PPE required for the role that has been undertaken throughout. Uh, and the supply chains are open and available and, you know, and, and remain, that remains the case. Um, we've done that through the produ production of a, a, a national arrangement through a procurement hub. Uh, and as I say, you know, it goes beyond the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service, and that's been delivered by uh, Kent Fire and Rescue Service on, on, on behalf of the whole of the Fire and Rescue Service, and that's allowed us to maintain the, the requisite levels of PPE throughout. Uh, we've also, in the discussions with Home Office um, the, and the Department of Health and Social Care, um, enabled, and albeit it's changed probably since then, but certainly in the early stages, they, those testing centres were restricted to NHS staff. Uh, very quickly, we were able to establish that they would be opened up for uh, ourselves, the critical key workers, emergency service workers, fire and rescue service staff, and that allowed us to, you know, to provide some reassurance to staff, but also get people back into work um, quickly to ensure that they are still available to undertake their roles. Uh, and you know, in addition to that, we've, it, we were able to make the case to secure a significant or a reasonably significant amount of funding from government uh, to support the work that we were undertaking. And again, the section in relation to financial considerations details that more specifically. But in the first instance, that would enable us to, to purchase uh, personal protective equipment and, uh, and, and so on and so forth that we didn't have readily available because of the tasks that we were undertaking uh, subsequently. We've also, um, as part, part of the national role, had a number of detailed uh, discussions at a national level with the trade unions around the reaching of tripartite agreements and the breadth of the work that we undertake now is significantly wider than the work that we undertook prior to um, COVID-19. One was focused in on our statutory responsibilities, the other one has recognised the, 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 the global challenge that the pandemic has brought and you know, it goes back to the strategic objective of providing broader support to the public sector. So we have stepped up um, and assisted as and when we can. And there's a number of examples from firefighters um, driving uh, ambulances to providing a face lift test and to, to some of the work that we are now looking to embark on around working in care homes to provide um, support and training around infection uh, prevention and control. And we've also sought over the period to remove some of the burdens um, that can sometimes come through government um, and to ensure that we were able to focus uh, on the task in hand and that's been done. More locally and from, from a Merseyside point of view, um, I'll certainly say before I move on to the Merseyside point of view, what I would also say is as lead authority for national resilience, we've also gathered in significant amounts of, of, of information um, which has provided updates to the minister. And I've got a further conversation with the minister at quarter past three today, uh, which provides them with reassurance around the arrangements that we've got in place. 
Um, and then moving on to the strategic coordination through the strategic coordinating group um, in paragraph, well, it's paragraph 24 um, and moves from page 280 to 281. You will see a list of, of actions that have been taken both operationally and probably more focused on the community risk management aspect of our work. And it is broad and it is detailed. And you can see for yourself the amount of uh, support that we provide to our uh, public sector health partners over the course of the last number of weeks and continue to do so um, and, and as we anticipate a, an additional maybe secondary peak and um, some part of the latter part of this year or early next we want to be able to ensure that we are able to maintain those relationships uh, longer into the future uh, but we continue to provide that support now and we will provide that through the recovery phase um, of our response to the pandemic um, challenges and then the latter part, and, and obviously uh, Deputy Chief Barrett and Excel led that, that part of our work. And then the, 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 probably the concluding part of the report itself talks about the arrangements we put in place around our own staff and our own business continuity arrangements, going back to that objective of maintaining operational response uh, capabilities across uh, the service. Uh, that work and the business continuity planning was, was led by the Assistant Chief Dave Mottram. And again, the report goes into a, a, an amount of detail there, which describes what we've done and how we've done it um, and how we've utilised technology to support the work that we've done. But again, it's broken down into the kind of key milestones for each one of the cells. And um, so it talks about some of the work we've done around operations. It talks extensively about the work we've done around workforce. So going back to Councillor Coleman's uh, questions around how we've supported our staff. It's long and detailed, the work that we've, we've sought to do. Um, and, you know, and then it moves on to the ICT, uh, so the utilisation of, uh, of technology, um, the utilisation of internal and external communications members, you know, a, a number of members have commented on how effective that's been throughout the period uh, and they felt well informed or staff, staff have felt likewise uh, and that extends to those in the workplace and those not in the workplace, those self-isolating. Uh, and that has been extensive and coordinated and consistent and remains the case. Uh, and then we've had the legal, financial, estates and logistical challenges, uh, some of which are you know, directly PPE related, which is about providing support to the frontline services. Paragraph 45 um, on page 287 details the legal implications, which Ria has, has, has touched on earlier on in the report. I don't intend to go over them uh, specifically, but I'm sure Ria would happily pick any of those up. And then if the report concludes with the financial implications and the releasing of two tranches of, of, of government funding, uh, the 1.6 billion across um, councils, um, a total of 3.2 billion in, in total, of which in the first allocation, um, we were allocated uh, 355,000. And on the second allocation, we were received 1.640,000. Uh, well, 1, um, and that's been utilised as described in paragraph 59, which goes on to show you where we've utilised that money around PPE, offset and loss of external contributions, loss of income, et cetera, et cetera, to lessen the burden on the authority. Um, and other than that, Chair, I'll probably conclude at that point, other than to say, you know, from a, an authority's point of view, you, you, know, you, you should be rightly proud of individuals who've worked in this service over the course of the last 12 weeks. They've gone well above and beyond what you would expect them to do on any normal uh, set of circumstances at every level in every part of the, this organisation from people who have you know, continued to uh, you know, make sure that we're keeping the, the wheels on in, in relation to finance, providing data from you know, strategy and performance, you know, from the cleaners who have maintained and continue to clean the building itself right through to, to officers who have been developing risk assessments to allow the, the work to be undertaken to firefighters and prevention staff and protection staff who have been on the front line, maybe doing slightly different jobs than they would have done ordinarily, uh, but they've been delivering food, prescriptions and the like to really vulnerable individuals who needed our support. And that has been really well received by our partners over the course of the last number of weeks. And we intend to continue to do that work longer and into the future. Well, thank you very much. I mean, we should recognise that we've been having a briefing today with the National Guard Commander and also uh, you're going to chair the 
uh, special group COVID-19 amongst the chiefs. You're right, I think, in saying that our people in Merseyside, the fire authority, all of us are members of, you know, local authorities. We've been doing individual things with our local authorities, but from the fire authority point of view, our, all of our staff at all levels have continued to show us uh, that they they are heroes and that every day they come and, and, and do things that other people would rather not do. I hope and know that this effort has been recognized nationally and I hope that uh, you know every everything that everyone has done will be properly uh, recognized in the overall picture of things when we come to the end of it. Now I've got indication from uh, first Councillor Kenny then Councillor Barrington. Yeah thank you Chair. Yeah well first of all I'd like to thank the Chief both for the verbal report and the written report we've got before us now. And certainly I am very proud, picking up one of his latter points, of the role of the fire authority over the last few weeks. I think it's actually been incredible, the work and the support that's been done. And I'd like to add my thanks and congratulations to everybody concerned. But on the actual report in front of us now, I've got no problem with the recommendations on page 277. I'd like yep. to comment, Chair, on um, a sentence on page 289, uh, paragraph 61. Now, the first sentence in paragraph 61, I think, is fine, but I'm not happy with the second sentence where it reads, the likelihood is governments will either need to increase taxes or cut public spending or both. I think that sentence as it stands is unhelpful. And I think it might be interpreted by some people as almost a tacit acceptance by the fire authority that sometime in the future, the government will do one or both of the two things mentioned here. So I think that's, that's unhelpful. Now, I'm not sure, Chair, whether it's possible to actually uh, amend the report or to ask for that sentence to be taken out. But I would certainly prefer paragraph 61 just to end uh, at the end of the first sentence. So I'm in your hands, Chair. I'm happy to, to move an amendment for that sentence to be taken out, or perhaps through you, Chair, the Chief might be willing to take that sentence out because I do feel it's unhelpful, and I think it might come back to rebound against us sometime in the future. So I'm in your hands as to how you want to play that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, and if it's just, I'm, I'm more than happy to take that sentence out. Okay, yeah, thank you, Chair. I think that okay. would be helpful. I mean, it's, it's, thank it, you. it is actually a, just a speculative comment uh, as part of the editing of this document. So if in the final version that goes into the minutes, that sentence is removed, then there's no problem with that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief. And, and thank you for flagging it up. It's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Barrington. Thanks for the report, and it's great to see all the work that's being done. And I'd like to thank everyone in the service for all the work they're doing. And in particular, I'd like to say um, a thanks for all the information we've received as members, because we have been kept really well informed throughout this. And just on point 16 on page 279, regarding the National Fire Control Group Actions, the last bullet point, uh, the removal of burdens during the period to allow services to focus on the support they are providing to the public. Can you just give some more information on that point, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so some examples where um, the requirement was for us to produce an, an integrated risk management plan and to go out to, to consult the public in regards to that IRMP. Um, and you know what was agreed by Home Office uh, and officers and, and the minister was that if services chose to extend their IRMP, that they could do that. So it, 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 our, our, the lifespan of ours was originally 70, uh, 17 through 20, but extended it to 19 to 21, and it was to carry it over. So they wouldn't expect us to have concluded all the actions within the, the kind of the designated period. There was a, probably a reflection of the fact that actually that would have been really challenging under those circumstances. They also require us to provide some information um, around statements of assurance. And again, and that whilst it's not 
overly burdensome for Merseyside. We were doing people quite comfortable for others. It's a little bit of work. And whilst they were really focused in on dealing with COVID-19, they suggested that they didn't require them to, to continue to complete uh, that statement of assurance. And then there is a number of Home Office returns around like, likes of protection activity, um, which again, they agreed that they would um, you know, pause whilst um, we were currently in the throes of, of, of dealing with COVID-19. So it was examples such as that, which is the burdens that we saw to uh, remove. So kind of quite uh, bureaucratic um, at times, understandable, but bureaucratic. And it would go in way, the way of the operational response particularly when some of the individuals who would fill the paperwork in or put the return in were, were, were probably either working from home or were self-isolated. So it was a, a, a challenge to services which they acknowledged and they removed that bit. Thank you. Uh, Chief, if you would take back the thanks of the whole of the Fire Authority to you and all of your colleagues and cascade that down to the whole uh, organisation um, uh, we are very grateful for everything that everyone has done during this very challenging time. It's not over yet. We're still, you know, uh, seeing the implications. But if you would pass that on. Sure. So uh, unless there are any questions, I don't see anyone else who wants to ask Rennie. a question. Um, Sorry, Councillor Rennie wants to make a comment. OK, right. Councillor Rennie. So you just need to unmute yourself, Councillor Rennie. I thought I heard. Okay, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can hear you. Hi, thank you. Um, ju just really to um, um, echo the comments that um, the Chair has just said, really. I mean, um, we know that, <coughs> excuse me, we're all proud of Merseyside Fire and Rescue and, and know the work that they do. And I don't think any of us doubted that they wouldn't step up to the plate and do what was expected and uh, a million times more than what we ever thought was expected. Um, just really um, to thank everybody. Um, the reports that we get weekly, I think it's Alex in the communications department sends the information out on behalf of um, Dave Mottram. Um, and I have asked a couple of times, um, is there parts of that that we could perhaps share um, with our groups on our local councils and, and where it's appropriate for us to share with uh, some community groups that we're still all in touch with virtually? Um, if perhaps we could have um, just some indication of what parts of those um, updates that we can share and clearly what we'd want to keep amongst ourselves. <clears throat> excuse me for croaking um not speaking to very many people at the moment um and also um i know that in Wirral, um our chief executive sends out a briefing where he includes comments which he's received from members of the public um which are all extremely positive and i was wondering perhaps if we could capture some of those as well and and um, send those out on the regular briefings that we get <clears throat> and then just finally um you know, clearly what we expect our, our paid staff to do um, has gone above and beyond. But, um, and I think I mentioned it when we had our practice last week, um, the work and also the care which all our staff must have from their family and friends to allow them to come out and do the fantastic job that they're doing. Um, I was talking remotely at a distance to a firefighter the other day, um, and his wife is uh, a paramedic, and they have two very small children, and you just wonder um, how a young family like that, you know, can cope and cope miraculously um, with all that's going on in their lives. So um, a huge thank you to um, our staff and to all their families. Thanks, Les. Thanks, Councillor Rennie. Thank you. Much appreciated. Very, very much appreciated. OK, uh, we heard you say that you, uh, the, the minister has got to speak to you to rely upon you to tell him what to say at 3.15. Uh, we That's fully right. understand that. So uh, with that in mind, um, is there anybody else who would like to say anything else at this point in time? Yeah, I'd like not... to something, if you don't mind, please. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, just to um, thank Phil and for, I'm sorry if this... Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, we can hear you, Councillor. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Chair, just to thank the chief and all the staff for all the hard work they've done, in particular on page 
281 where the community risk management i'd just like to thank you all for the support that you've given over the last couple of weeks for teardrops and once again i know i, I mentioned this in our practice last week but it really really was appreciated by teardrops and to see children's faces when the fire engine turns up with food parcels for disa disa disability children and children with palliative care. It means so much to them. So Chair, I'd like to thank the Chief and all the staff from my heart and thanks for all the hard work that you do. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, well said, thank you. And there'll be lots of things. I mean, I read through that report and the list of things we do. There'll be loads of stuff that we haven't captured. There'll be lots of things that people are just doing and getting on with and you know uh, and, and making the community of merseyside better stronger safer what i want to do at this point um is to just ask members if they th this item um covid19 note all of the abc to e are note so the recommendation is that this uh, report be noted with the uh, amendment uh, to the report as uh, discussed with uh, with councillor kenny uh, if I don't hear anything to the contrary, I will assume that this is agreed. So we can put that into the record as agreed. So with the possibility of a quick catch up uh, in uh, after the meeting is formally closed, I think that is the conclusion of the agenda. Thank you to uh, Kelly and the Democratic team, Rhea. Uh, Chief, all the officers involved in preparing the papers, the Herculean task again of getting us all online and keeping us online. And uh, as I say, I think the technology will rise to the challenge in due course, not there yet. Um, I will uh, formally close the meeting with the other note of saying that the next meeting will be, uh, it's a placeholder, our AGM on the 11th of June, 2020. But with that said, if it is possible to close the live part of the meeting, would it be possible just for members to hold back? Kelly, can we do that? Sorry, yes, absolutely, yeah, we can do that. I'll 